Article 1, Section 8, LAX, three years before Election Day. No, you can't have another chance, Megan insisted into her phone as she collected her things in her dorm room for her trip. We broke up. It's final. But baby, I love you. Alex, for a whole year I loved you back. You should have acted like you loved me then. Baby, I want another chance, he moaned. Then you should have thought of that before you hooked up with that what's-her-name. But baby... Megan hit the red button that terminated the conversation. It had been six months since Megan had broken up with the tall, charming Alexander Randleman. As the starting center for UCLA's basketball team, Alex didn't need to exert himself to woo Megan. They had gotten involved before Megan's big Hollywood break. Yet, even as she was filming her breakout movie, Alex had others. She wondered if he had tempted those others with the opportunity to replace a Hollywood actress in his affections. Now she was getting the sense that he wanted her back, mainly to show off to his buddies with an actress on his arm. Megan put the phone down and opened the box she had received from the toy company. She took out one of the action figures and put it into her purse. The ride-sharing service would arrive soon to take her to the airport. Jerry Neville had promised to fly her round trip to San Francisco for their coffee date. She would be home before bedtime. The hour-long flight was uneventful. Megan had flown to and from filming locations on private planes, but she had never been on one nearly as high-end as Neville's. When the Gulfstream landed in San Carlos Airport near San Francisco, it was met by a limousine. The chauffeur stood quietly by the open back door of the car, and waited until Megan climbed in. Without being asked, the chauffeur opened up the barrier that divided the driver's cockpit from the passenger compartment. Mr. Neville flew you to San Carlos Airport because it's closer to the Chirp campus than San Francisco International, he said. Also, your arrival here will attract less attention. Without another word, he closed the barrier and drove off. There wasn't much to see out the window, so Megan checked her phone. Within a few minutes, she began to smooth the flowery white jersey dress that she had selected, wondering whether Neville would like it. Were these the right shoes? Looking up from her grooming, she noticed the menacing-looking wall looming up ahead. The limousine drove up to it and stopped at the security gate with the Chirp logo on it. Megan put away her phone and took out the compact and the tube of lipstick she kept in her purse. Megan had noticed that when she went out in public without makeup, she was recognized by fans far less frequently. When she wanted to avoid the autograph seekers, the selfie seekers, or the people calling out movie lines to her, she would skip the cosmetics. With a billionaire to impress, Megan got to work on her appearance. Inside the security wall was a world far different from the city outside. Gone was the patchy grass and the cracked pavement littered with soft drink containers and snack bags that Megan had become accustomed to in so much of California. Gone also were the tents and the open-air drug markets of the addicts and derelicts that lined the streets she had just passed through. Instead, the lush green rolling hills of the campus were guarded and attended to by uniformed personnel manicuring the grounds. Acres of immaculate lawn surrounded a giant prism of a building. The building appeared to be constructed entirely of glass, except for the large blue bird that adorned each face of the structure. That was the official logo of the Chirp Corporation. As the limousine made its way along the access road, dazzling flashes of sunlight gleamed off the mirrored surface of the building. Joggers and cyclists, each wearing Chirp-themed exercise clothing, huffed and puffed their way along the network of trails that cut through spacious lawns and groves of trees. The limousine wended its way through the grounds to a small parking lot near the giant building. The area looked like a back entrance. The limousine stopped, and the chauffeur hopped out of the car and opened Megan's door. She got out and realized she was less than ten steps from the glass door that led into the building. The chauffeur opened it for her, and she walked in. He returned to the car and drove off. The calming aroma of brownies confronted Megan immediately upon entering the room. Looking around, the room very much resembled the typical coffee shop that serves the public. 
The half dozen tables that stood in the middle of the room and the sofas that leaned against the walls seemed pretty standard. Over the sofa to her left was a painting. Under its round frame was a brass sign that informed the viewer that the painting was called Laughing Child by Franz Halls. Over the couch to her right was another painting. This time, the plaque said it was called Diana Resting by Jean-Francois Millet. Duly impressed, she had a closer look at the furniture. It was then that she noticed the extraordinary patterns in the wood grain of the tabletops and the chairs. This furniture must have cost a fortune. At one of those glossy, round tables sat Jerry Neville. The suit he wore didn't fit him well, and he appeared uncomfortable wearing it. While everything else the man owned was the best that money could buy, it seemed that his suit was an off-the-rack afterthought. Megan could picture him lounging about his multi-million dollar Gulfstream in a torn t-shirt and sweats. Standing up to greet her, Neville didn't hold eye contact for long. It took Megan a second to realize that Neville had reached his full height. The last time she had been awkwardly approached by a man so short, she dismissed him with the offer of a stepladder. Studying his face, Megan noticed a small shaving cut that called attention to his blemished cheeks. She wondered if he had shaved to make a good impression on her. Rather than feeling scorn for his trying too hard, Megan felt charmed that despite his billions, he was making an effort to attract her. Would you like a coffee? A snack? Neville asked as they sat down at the opulent table. I'll have a cappuccino and a brownie, Megan answered. Eddie, Neville called out. The barista who had been quietly manning the empty coffee bar came to life to prepare Megan's order and Neville's usual. Reaching into her bag, Megan pulled out the Lenore action figure she had brought. This is for you, she said. It's from the Raven movie I was in. The toy company that makes them sent me a bunch. It's supposed to look like me, but I'm not sure it does. I even signed the package for you. Neville studied the plastic figure intently, turning it in his hand. The shiny, skin-tight black and red armor revealed the doll's chiseled physique. Its blonde hair tumbled over the domino mask that hid her eyes. The mighty right arm clutched a formidable energy gun. As he manipulated the figure's arms, he realized they moved stiffly due to its newness. I don't think any woman has ever given me a heavily armed plastic sculpture of herself before. Megan did not expect to laugh as long or as hard as she did at so lame a joke. She was interrupted by Eddie, delivering their drinks and brownies. First he placed Neville's brownie and then his cup of black coffee. Next to it, he set down a creamer full of whole organic milk. Then he attended to Megan's order. As he was being served, Neville took off his suit jacket and handed it to the server, who departed with it and the empty tray. Looking him over in his short-sleeved white dress shirt, she had to question why she was reacting to Neville as she did. His soft, skinny arms made her think she could easily beat him in an arm wrestle. In her days with Alex, she would have snorted in contempt at the advances of a physical specimen such as Neville. She found herself explaining to herself that his emaciated physique was evidence of his dedication to his life's work. She suddenly pictured herself caring for him. She saw herself helping to bring him out of his shell and providing him with the love that would inspire him to improve himself. Turning her attention to her plate, Megan considered the brownie. Never had she seen a baked confection quite like the one on the plate before her. But the ones her grandmother made when Megan would visit were excellent. The thought of them would bring back cherished memories of the warmth, love, and acceptance. Primly, she took a bite. The brownie was nothing like she had ever tasted before. Her eyes rolled back as she savored it. Megan was jolted out of her reverie by a surprisingly loud slurp. Neville had started on his coffee. Putting down the cup, he picked up his own brownie and attacked the pastry with gusto. With each energetic, open-mouthed chew, Neville smacked his lips. Megan smiled. If he could afford such excellent food, he must really enjoy it. Finishing his brownie, Neville looked up at Megan and spoke. Once upon a midnight dreary, he said. While I pondered weak and weary, answered a beaming Megan. The dialogue passed between Raven and Lenore several times in the Raven movie. 
Megan had smilingly, if a bit robotically, answered the hundreds of comic book fans who tried it on her at the Wonder Comics convention as she signed autographs and took selfies with fans. She had been paid to attend and wanted to satisfy them. On campus, she usually rolled her eyes at the geeks who tried to chat her up with that line. Now she found herself delighted that Neville knew it. Did you always like comic books? Megan asked, scooting her chair closer to his. Only a bit. I was more into math and computers growing up, Neville said. That must have been great for your social life in high school, Megan cooed, gazing at him and playing with a lock of blonde hair. Not really, but I did have a chance to go to the International Mathematics Olympiad. Really? Megan enthused, touching Neville's hand. I didn't know I was talking to an Olympian. Megan felt Neville's hand twitch at her touch, but his smile gave away that he liked it. She could tell he hadn't expected it. The confidence, even arrogance, of the men who usually attracted her attention was not Neville's, at least not with women. He was probably a real go-getter in the boardroom. Thinking about this, Megan concluded that he was not the player type who would move on to the next girl at the first opportunity. In fact, she had recently read an article online that said that nerdy men weren't typically the type to break a woman's heart. Maybe that article was the reason she gave in to the strange urge to chat up Eric Appleton. I didn't actually go to the Olympiad. Believe it or not, I had more important things to attend to. Wow, like what? I had a programming project I was working on at the time. Suddenly, Megan pictured the young Neville. He was so dedicated to computing his first true love that he wouldn't let himself be distracted by the temptation of the math Olympiad. You know, I like math and science, too. Believe it or not, I'm pre-med, Megan confessed. Brains and beauty, too, Neville said. I guess I just demonstrated that old joke. What old joke? How do you know that somebody's pre-med? How? Don't worry, they'll tell you. Neville chuckled. Are you going to continue with that, now that you're in the movies? Yes, but we'll see how the movie career develops. Well, if you ever need a tutor... I have the world's finest stable of math and science talent here at CHIRP. Thank you. Hey, do you want to take a tour of the CHIRP campus? Sure. Megan and Neville finished their coffees and got up. He led her to the formidable door that separated the coffee shop from the rest of the CHIRP building. He placed his palm on the reader next to it to unlock it. It opened to a small lobby with an elevator whose door was already open and ready for the pair to board. Neville pressed a button, and soon they were one floor up, in an airy, spacious, two-story room bathed in natural light from the floor-to-ceiling windows that surrounded it. Brightly colored columns, decorated with Chirp's logo rather than walls, were the only structures that divided the area. Many of them also featured slogans meant to encourage the workforce who worked and dined in the room. All of the food in our employee cafeteria is sustainably sourced, Neville said, pointing at the food service stand in the middle of the room that fed the employees. It's all vegan. No milk, no meat, not even honey. Megan looked at the workers at the tables, enjoying their almond milk lattes and their soy milk cappuccinos as they toiled away at their coating. One of them noticed her and called out, Once upon a midnight dreary! She ignored him and followed Neville around the room. As they neared the salad bar, She couldn't help but notice the pans of crickets and mealworms displayed next to the containers of salad greens, tofu, and dressings. Feeling a bit uneasy, she poked Neville. Are these bugs really edible? she asked. Yes, said Neville, scrunching his nose a bit. You told me that the cafeteria was vegan. Are these really vegan, though? Since the bugs are sustainably sourced, at Chirp, we consider them a vegan alternative to meat and fish, Neville answered. As they continued through the cafeteria tables, Megan couldn't help but be impressed as she noticed most of the workers forcing themselves to keep their faces pointed towards their laptops and their hands busy with the keyboards. Having shown her around the cafeteria, Neville beckoned Megan back to the elevator. Up one more floor was the main office space. This time, they arrived at a giant open floor plan workplace. All of the hundreds of employees who labored away were at desks arranged in bullpens so they could, in Neville's words, bounce ideas off each other. 
There were half a dozen desks in each bullpen. Each desk was personalized by its owner with plastic science fiction action figures, stuffed animals, or with quirky math-themed decorations that only an engineer could love. On that floor, surrounding the work areas, were game rooms with video games, table tennis, billboards, and chess. Pantries and other creature comforts kept the employees fed and content during their endless hours of work. When they noticed Neville, these engineers at work in the room glued their faces to their screens and their fingers to their keyboards. Neville soon got tired of touring the office, full of conspicuously hard-at-work coders. It's a beautiful day, he said. Let's have a walk outside. Barely waiting for her response, Neville crossed the room to the elevator. This time, he took her to the one used by the employees. Megan barely caught up to him as he pushed the button to summon a car on its way down. When it arrived, Megan saw that the walls of the elevator were made out of black chalkboard. Employees were encouraged to use the provided chalk to share appropriate messages. Most of what was written was either mathematical equations or nerdy jokes. An occasional left-wing political message was thrown in as well. When the elevator released them into the main lobby, employees greeted the pair. Not just a few shouted lines from the Raven movie at Megan. The pair crossed through the main entrance lobby and out the main doors. Standing near the group of bike racks, Neville took out his cell phone and pushed a few buttons. It was not long before a gleaming black golf cart driven by a man in a chirp polo shirt stopped in front of them. Following Neville's lead, Megan took her seat in the vehicle. Take us to Jerry's garden, Neville ordered. Beeping at the bikers and joggers as he sped down the trail, Neville's driver passed the basketball and tennis courts, even a badminton court for the enjoyment of Neville's numerous East Asian employees. Scattered sparsely around the lawn were employees using trash pickers to fill garbage bags with the litter that had blown onto the campus from the nearby highways. Ultimately, the driver pulled into what looked like a children's playground, surrounded by a flower garden. Neville and Megan got out of the golf cart. The driver took off at once. I built this place not long ago, Neville confided as he led Megan to the swing set. It reminds me of the place I used to go when I was a boy when I felt sad. Megan just nodded. I remember when I asked Krista Bernini to prom and she turned me down. Neville's voice trailed off. Megan wondered why it seemed so cute and vulnerable when Neville mentioned one that got away so long ago. Oddly, it seemed neither creepy nor pathetic. Cute and vulnerable just seemed to be the right words to describe it. She told herself that he would really appreciate her if she would be a good girlfriend and that he would do what it took to make the relationship work. Suddenly brightening up, Neville ran to the merry-go-round. This is fun. Come here, he shouted. Megan joined him. They used to have these in every playground when I was a kid, he continued. With all the lawsuits, parks are afraid to install them. They're fun, so I bought one. Here, get on. Megan climbed between the rectangular bars onto the red metal circle. She held on as Neville began to spin the carousel with all his might. Slowly at first, it began to turn. As he heaved it over and over again, it got faster and faster. Soon, Megan was throwing her head back and laughing. The turning slowed as Neville tired. Megan stepped off. That was fun, she said, planting a prim kiss on his lips. Neville smiled. He took her hand and led her to the park bench to sit. After an hour of conversation, Neville got out his phone and summoned the golf cart. I had a good time with you today, Megan, Neville said. We should do this again. I'd like that. No need to worry about missing your flight, eh? Yeah, I guess not. I'll get you your car he said as the golf cart arrived back at the building. She didn't have to wait long for the limousine. Before she got in, she hugged Neville and then gave him another quick kiss. This time, he returned it. When she arrived at the airport, she boarded Neville's plane and turned to the pilot. Does Mr. Neville do this for all his girls? What girls? the pilot asked. Article 1, Section 9 the Adams Building, Harwood University, three years before Election Day. 
The slap of Hall's old-fashioned canvas basketball shoes filled the concrete stairwell with echoes. Taking the steps two at a time, Hall bounded to the second floor of the Adams Building. Striding across the landing, Hall thrust his weight into the push bar that served the weighty metal door. Its loud crack reverberated off the concrete. He crossed into the hallway and turned towards room 201. Already getting warm, Hall took off his coat, leaving him with only the gray sweater and the khakis that he had hoped would make a good impression. He had carefully brushed his thick blonde hair, but he managed to tousle it up quite a bit when he mindlessly swept his hand through it as he made his way towards the classroom. Hall had been mulling over Shanice's problem since lunch that day, but he only had a few vague ideas when he opened the classroom door. No sooner had he stepped through the door than a slim, pretty black woman offered him a handshake and a smile. You're Jonathan Hall, right? Yes. How'd you know? You're the only new guy that's been to our meetings in a while. I'm Shanice. I invited you. Shanice was much shorter than Hall had expected. She would have stood out on almost any occasion at Harwood University simply because the green dress she was wearing was a marked contrast to the sweatshirt and jeans combination so typical of co-eds on campus. Her shiny, jet-black hair was long, straight, and kept with great care. Hall couldn't tell if she was wearing makeup, but something about her face just looked right, like this was exactly the way she wanted to appear to the world. Hall tried to look indifferent, but he couldn't help replaying in his mind the ways Shanice had smiled at him. She invited Hall to sit at any of the theater-style seats that overlooked the lecture area. He would have his choice of where to sit. Only about 12 of Harwood's 11,000 sat among the 10 rows. Hall selected an aisle seat in the ninth row and, throwing his coat onto the seat beside it, sat down. Looking around, Hall was not impressed by what he saw. His general impression was that it was one beautiful woman surrounded by a pack of sad sack doofuses. Two soft, young, bow-tied men sat together in the front, whispering to each other. When the meeting began, one of the bow-tied pair stood up, and seeing a new face among those present, introduced himself as Karsten, the club's president. He proceeded to address the meeting, mostly whining about the group's problems. To start with, the group had a number of unofficial members, supporters of the group's message, who would not officially join the organization for fear of impairing job or social opportunities after graduation, if they were on record as abortion opponents. The club president's litany of complaints was very similar to what Shanice had told him on the phone. It wasn't long before Hall was looking at his watch. The other club members also looked bored as the president continued to bellyache. A hand was raised. One club member, who introduced himself as Hunter, proposed having a club newsletter. Hall was reaching for his coat when Shanice stood up. Interrupting the president's remarks, she addressed the group. For today's meeting, I called Jonathan Hall to come by. Those of you who were here last year probably remember him from that whole thing with Abu Kamal speaking at graduation. I don't mean to put you on the spot, Jonathan, but can I turn today's meeting over to you? Maybe you can help us get the Campus Center for Life off the ground, she said, gesturing with her hand to give Hall the floor. Standing up and striding to the front of the room, Hall found himself more nervous than he had expected. He didn't care what the dweebs thought. He wanted Shanice to smile at him again the way she had when he walked in. Reaching the front of the room and turning to the members, he shifted back and forth as he gathered his thoughts. Well, I guess, um, if I had to advise you, I guess I should ask you what this club is about. What is your goal here? We oppose abortion. Isn't that obvious? Karsten answered. You oppose abortion? Yes. How's that working out for you? What are you trying to say, that we shouldn't oppose abortion? Kind of, Hall answered to the grumbles of the doofuses. Let him speak, Shanice said, standing up and gesturing to the group to settle down. I invited him here to give us some ideas. Let's see where this is going. Okay, let's back up a bit. Shanice tells me that you guys keep getting your science torn down when you put them out. What did you do about that? I wrote a letter to the editor of the Buccaneer. I put a video online, replied another sad sack. Okay, so let me get this straight. When this group is bullied, you write seldom published letters to the student newspaper or whine and seldom watch videos on the internet. You guys are a bunch of jabronis. A bunch of what? A peeved Karsten demanded. Jabronis, Hall answered. It's a term from professional wrestling. 
is one of those guys in a wrestling show whose job is to go out there and to lose. A guy who's not even trying to win. So what are you saying we should do? Karsten snorted. I don't know, but if you guys are willing to actually fight, we might be able to figure it out together. Shanice called me here because of how I handled the Abu Kamal invitation. Maybe we should start with that. The attendees crossed their arms. I realized that the college had counted on debating whether a cop killer should be speaking on campus. I have no doubt that they had their entire strategy prepared. They'd bang on about redemption and rehabilitation and, and his human rights activism and all that. But I took them away from their area of expertise. He continued as he started pacing the floor, lost in thought. I chose the topic of the debate myself. Instead of, should a cop killer be allowed to speak, I made the debate about the Pattersons. Instead of talking about a murderer committed decades ago by a human rights activist, we're talking about the pain felt right now by widows and orphans. Now, when you're talking about Abu Kamal, we're talking about a daddy killer and a widow maker. Getting no response, Hall continued. You can't just sit around waiting for an issue to oppose. You must take the fight to them. Don't let the opponent set the agenda. If you do, you'll be fighting on the ground of your opponent's choosing, on ground that's been carefully prepared for your defeat. Right now, you're discussing whether there should be women's health care, or choice, or reproductive freedom. You've already lost. Most of the group looked skeptical. Look, opposing abortion means you're opposing an abstraction. So you could be defeated by abstract terms like women's health, Hall continued. So what do we do? asked Karsten. You need a specific target to oppose, a specific person or organization. Show the world who they really are when they think nobody's looking. How about the Margaret Sanger Center for Women's Health? One club member proposed. Go on, Hall prompted. They're the country's biggest abortion provider. Great. Now, what you must do is find out where they are weakest. How do you do that? The Sanger Center calls itself pro-choice, right? They say they're providing women's health care, right? Well, find a way to show that the words they use to describe themselves are nothing but cynical lies. How do we do that? I don't know, but I do know this. They might be bravely fighting for women's rights, or they may be cynically profiting off of other people's misfortune. What would they do if they were brave fighters for women's rights? What would they do if they were profiteers? I can't tell. How about we design an experiment to see which one they are? You know, a video went viral a few years ago. A guy called the Sanger Center and offered to donate money to fund the abortion of a black baby. What happened? They accepted the donation without complaint. Now you're talking. That shows them for who they are, doesn't it? So, we should do something like that? Well, it's a start, Hall replied. Prank phone calls, Karsten demanded. That's what you're bringing this guy here to tell us, Shanice? We don't need tricks. What we need is a place at the table, the respect we deserve. You guys are begging for table scraps, said Hall. Seems to me you are getting the respect you deserve. After a moment of awkward silence, Hall reached for his coat. He walked out, as the room was beginning to be filled by grumbling. Shanice followed. They're not even having any fun, Hall commented when he noticed Shanice. It's like a funeral in there. I really liked what you said, Shanice said as they descended the stairway together. Thank you. I think I'm the only one, though. I could tell. After a moment, Hall proposed, You already have my number. Give me yours. You think you could help me fight without those, um, Shanice began, without those losers? Yeah, I wasn't going to say it. You think you could help me? I might be able to come up with an idea or two. Okay, here's my number. Be in touch. A smiling Hall made his way to the bike rack to find his bicycle. The evening had turned out better than he had expected. This is Ari Mendelson. I hope you're enjoying Consent. I'd love it if you could show your appreciation for my years of hard work by hitting that like button and subscribing to my channel. But why keep this adventure to ourselves? I wrote Kingmaker because I believe its message of keeping control of our own minds is one that America needs to hear. Young men especially will profit from learning the message that lies at the heart of these novels, that the straightest path to happiness is by improving yourself one step at a time, rather than attempting to change others. So, 
share this audiobook far and wide across your favorite social platforms. See the description below for other ways for you to support my work. Thank you so much for your time and attention.